right. So we're here today. My name is Derek Fahey. I'm a registered patent attorney with the Plus IP firm. I'm here with my partner, Mark Terry. Mark, say hello. How's it going, Derek? Good to see you. All right. So we're excited to talk about patents today. And, uh, you know, this program is really meant to be talking about, you know, patentable subject matter as it relates to software. We're going to go over some some patents that we find interesting just to kind of dispel the myth that software is not patentable. And probably for, uh, you know, a sophisticated inventor or um, some other patent attorneys that don't deal in software. But before we get started, Mark, I got some questions for you. All, all right, right so forward. rapid fire questions. I'll answer the same, all right? So um, first one, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? I'm going to go with San Diego. San Diego. Okay, I like that. Uh, why? They seem to have like the best weather in the United States. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm thinking Jackson Hole so I can go ski in. Okay. If you could have coffee with one historical figure, who would you choose? John von Neumann. Okay. Why? <laughs> uh, he just seems like he was probably one of the smartest guys in the last hundred years. Okay. Contributed to like so many different areas of science and mathematics. Seems like he would be the guy to meet. Yeah. For me, I would maybe like someone like really, really old in their time zone so that I could like learn about like how the pyramids got built and stuff like that for me. I think it's kind of cool. All right. That's what was your, okay. yeah. What was your favorite subject in school? By the way, I've only, I only read the first question. So everything else is new for me, but. What was your favorite subject in school? Uh, math. Me too. I was math. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, what was your favorite trip you've ever taken? Oh, man. Favorite trip you've ever taken? Um, I'm going to go. Besides your honeymoon, of course, man. Besides yeah, your honeymoon. Yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> honeymoon. Um, I'm going to say Thailand. That was an awesome trip for you. Um, my honeymoon was pretty dope. I went to the Maldives. Um, but, uh, I kind of want to say Thailand too, man. I tried backpacking over Asia after college for like four months. It was unbelievable. Um, okay. Um, if you won $10 million tomorrow, what will you spend it on? $10 million. I'm going to go with a super high powered telescope. Wow. Oh man. <laughs> 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 I'm just gonna leave that one alone. This is from the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, okay, it's amazing. Yeah, oh, you can no. see a lot of that stuff from your backyard. You know, assuming yeah. you, you can pay for a telescope for that size. Yeah, about- I feel. I feel like ten million dollars is not gonna is not enough to to buy James to buy uh, <laughs> James Webb Telescope. No. Uh, for me, honestly, mine is even simpler, man. I probably would just hire more people to work in my business so I can help other people. That's really the only thing I would do. So I can just work on the stuff I only want to work on, you know? Um, anyways, okay. um, if you had to write a book tomorrow, what would you write about? Um, I would write about uh, the philosophy of behind patent law, I think. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I write how to win ten million dollars. I think that's my that's okay. my All right. All right. What's your biggest pet peeve? Oh, pet peeve, I would say um the way that it uh you know uh the way that attorneys um many attorneys behave in during litigation is my biggest pet peeve. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Mine is just lack of responsiveness. It's like my biggest pet peeve. But uh, okay, that was fun. All right, next next time you'll come up with the, the questions. Okay. I really, I really only looked at one or two of them, so these are tough. Good stuff. All right, so next question. What's hmm. the funniest thing you've heard a patent examiner say to you? Um, Funniest. Let's see. Um, well, he, here's one, here's, it's, it's kind of more interesting than funny, but, um, this guy said to me, he's, we were having a discussion about 
101 rejections and I, I didn't you know obviously I disagreed with them I was being very diplomatic about it and you know, his position was absolutely not and I was just trying to get some concession out of him right and he and he eventually just got really frustrated and he said uh look this is uh you know I'm gonna this is a one I'm, I'm gonna stand by this one or one rejection and if you appeal me, my uh, my win rate at the at the patent trademark and appeal board is ninety nine percent. That's what he said. He said that to me. Okay. Uh, well, well, mine uh, <laughs> mine uh, recently happened actually. So I w I was on an after pilot after final pilot program, and we followed a response. Um, really, really, you know, relatively soon after the final office action, and which typically the examiner will like will examine it within the three months, and you'll have like opportunity to respond. And I called them like two times, and the examiner never they didn't respond. It was like, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get to it. And, and like after the we got the response after the three month deadline to respond, which means now I had to pay fees and. And he didn't give me additional time to respond because according to the rules, you know, you, you get some additional time if you respond within the, within two months. Okay. And so I call a supervisor and I called him and eventually he called me back and was like, yeah, you know, you're, you're right. Um, you know, I, I messed up. I should have checked box B instead of check box A and, and you, you do have more time, um, you know, so I'll send you an email for my, supervisor on it and i said to him i was like well you know i, I actually i called your supervisor because you never got back to me for like three or four days and i i called and so i like you know just a heads up you know like i called your supervisor just you know don't be you know don't just know that i did so just a heads up and he's like yeah you know she's already he's already yelled at me a couple of times <laughs> for, for, for something that he did wrong so yeah it's not really an issue and I was just like, oh, okay, oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Sometimes you got to do that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, you know, today we're kind of talking about spelling some myths about software. And, you know, we, we did do another blog post about responding to one or three rejections. You can find that on our YouTube channel if you're interested. We'll drop a link in our, in this, in this, in the comments. But Mark, um, Show me, why don't you show me some, uh, why don't you show me one of some, uh, any interesting patents you've kind of come across and explain what you, why you thought it was interesting and how they were to get a patent on. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let me show you. Um, I've got this one patent up here, which is this um, IBM patent. And uh, I'm just going to- I can't see your screen, yeah. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. Let's see here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, here we go. So this is a, an IBM patent, and it's about uh, delivering items with an unmanned aerial vehicle. So you know, there's been a lot of a lot of movement in this area of delivering things using UAVs. And uh, so here you see one of here you see one of the figures. Um, and I think this figure really it really speaks to what this is all about, which is the idea of having cars bring the uh the drone to certain areas and then the uh once you get near the uh delivery point the unmanned aerial vehicle will detach from the car do the delivery and then can land on some other car right so i thought that was very interesting um but you really i really wonder you know the, the idea of having uh, drones deliver is known. The idea of having drones attached to uh, vehicles is known. So how do they get this patent? Well, if take a look. Take a look at the claims. Uh, I'll I'll point out I'll point out one of the keys to getting this patent here. So here you here we're getting the claim one, right here you got claim one, which is the most important part of this whole patent, um, and. When you read through it, you'll see, you re read through this claim one here, you'll see that a lot of it is fairly 
simple. The idea of a drone landing on a vehicle and so on and so forth. But here, here, here's the key to the whole thing, which I found very interesting. It's this piece here, which I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, put in, in a rectangle here, um, right here, right? So it's this little piece here. Can you read that, Derek? Yeah. Okay. So it's this little piece here that talks about a risk assessment. And I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll paraphrase it for you. It's basically a method by which uh, the device will, the, the system will determine whether or not there's some sort of a, a risk associated with the coupling. So that if there's, a, let's just say there's some high winds or maybe the car is swerving and this connection between the, uh, the drone and the car is somehow compromised, it's gonna fall off or it's just not, it's not connecting properly. You've got a little program that's constantly running and that's looking at that. And if it determines there's too much risk, it just immediately detaches and flies away. But that was interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, I got one for you. Um, okay. This one is actually, I use this one a lot to talk about user interfaces and how it can be kind of, well, let me show you my screen here. Hold on a second. This is actually one of the patents that, you know, the Tinder app, like when you swipe right, swipe right, swipe right, mm -hmm. and swipe left if for a dating app. Um, I thought it was kind of cool. I use, I actually use arguments. Can you guys see my, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. So this is actually a, a patent that was in litigation between uh, Tinder, which is owned by a match group and uh, Bumble. And if you can see, you know, here's the interface and uh, the different interfaces. And uh, you, you can see how, you know, swipe right. Nope, that's swipe left, right? You don't want this person or, and swipe right. It's a match. So, you know, pretty, really big in, in, um, in dating and, uh, you know, I actually was able to use that before I got married really briefly. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember seeing it. So hey, it don't, wow. don't gloss over that. <laughs> don't gloss over that. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, okay. Well, that, yeah, so. okay. Well, we'll edit that one out. Okay. But what I thought was amazing was how if people it just, you know, dating, dating apps became cool. Right. It was like before, you know, there's always dating websites. You can go on like match.com or eHarmony. And everybody was like using it, but it became cool to swipe right and swipe left. And you, you know, you hear all the funny jokes about people just swiping right, like hunt and going through hundreds of profiles at one time. And the reason why they I think they got the patent because it was a reason why it was so cool. It was the interface was so cool. And um the arguments that are that well, I'll show you the parts of the claims. The claim section is here, all right? And I'll highlight here um, parts of it and how were they able to get, you know, get a patent. And essentially, uh, you know, profile matching is known, but it was the, the concept of using a gesture, like a swipe um, left or right for profile matching. And uh, you'll see some language here. I'll, I'll show it to you right here. It says, um, receiving, you know, from a second electronic device, the second user, a positive indication uh, regarding the first user, mm -hmm. all right? And then you see here, uh, up here too as well, you'll see here receiving from the first electronic device from a first user, a first indication, um, and I'll paraphrase it here, but a first gesture indicating uh, that the first user has a positive indication of the profile they're looking at it. And first, you know, is like the guy and he swipes saying that he liked some girl. And then that second piece you highlighted there is the girl who swiped indicating she liked that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And what's right. cool, what, what I use this for, and I use the arguments, it's actually a case called trading technologies versus CQ, CQG. And essentially that case basically says that, you know, uh, you know, not all just not all interfaces are abstract. You can have certain non-abstract interfaces that solve problems of 
you know, previous graphical user interfaces before it was really boring, right? Before it was really boring just to go you know, profile match online and, you know, say, yes, I like this person. Now you have this cool software that allows you to select and profile match by swiping left and swiping right. And I thought that was really cool. And I use this argument a lot when I'm dealing with interfaces so in order to get around rejections and to argue that it's not an abstract idea. So I thought that was kind of cool. And um, so, you know, people say software is dead or software patents are dead, not so. So that's, a, that's one patent I thought was really cool that I, that I, that I talk about quite a bit. Yeah, that was very topical because Tinder is so it's it's used by so many millions of people. Yeah, interestingly, they actually the C, apparently the CEO of Bumble, which was a spinoff from Tinder, and they were involved in this major patent litigation involving these patents that we're showing here today. I believe they eventually settled, but it was a nasty litigation. The CEO of Bumble, who left Tinder, was alleging like um you know, um, sexual harassment and all, or some uh, allegations that were not, you know, that, you know, were not the best against uh, Tinder and the executives. I don't really know all the facts. These are just allegations that are in court, but, uh, you know, it just was a really nasty set of litigation. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, let me show you, um, let me show you another one I got here. Okay. Okay. This is uh, this is going off of that same concept, which is yeah. <laughs> so it was one of my uh, one of my favorites here, which is the idea of of a drone on a car, right? Now this, unlike the previous one, which was an IBM patent, this is a Microsoft patent. Okay, and again. It's just generally the idea of bringing these drones to an area to do deliveries on a car. It's going to attach itself to a car. Okay. Yeah. Now, what's different about this one? Okay. What I really liked about this one, if you take a look at the claim, it has to do with the process. And, and I'm going to um, highlight this so you can see this better. It's this little piece right here. Um, here we go. This right here was the reason that this patent application was allowed, um, which is this process of the drone maintaining a synchronized velocity with the car, which makes sense, right? I mean, if you're gonna have this drone landing on a moving car, they have to be moving at the same rate. Right. Uh, if when you read the rest of it, right, the rest of that claim is basically just landing a drone on a car, which actually was well known. And there's there was uh, there were prior art references that were cited here that that explained exactly that. Hmm. How was this patent allowed? Just this one this one piece of the claim, which is, hey, we want to land on a moving car. In order to do that, they have to synchronize their speeds. And that was what pushed it over the edge and it made it patentable. Wow, that's cool. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it kind of it kind of indicates that um, this whole delivering with a drone thing is really is uh, this in my eyes validates it. It's it's a real thing now. It seems like it's going to happen. That's cool. So I can see why they wanted to enter into this space and get some protection. Cool. Uh, I have one more for you. This one is. This one is more, um, I wouldn't call it AI, but it's more, it's more like a software application. So this is um, a company that actually, they do campaigns for, for sending phishing campaigns and, and simulated phishing attacks to train okay. your employees, okay? And um, that's fairly well known, right? So saying, sending um, a phishing email, a simulated phishing email to your employees in order to see if they click on it, to see, you know, so they can learn about like what not to do, you know, yeah. when, you get the in, when you get the invoice that says pay here and it's an HTML and you, you should know like, hey, I should not be clicking on that, right? Well, of this particular, this particular- Everyone should do that by now. Uh, yeah, right, seriously. Um, you'd be surprised, but this particular patent, um, well, they actually got the, their, and this is kind of why I want to show you this is 
you know, it makes such a big difference about the little things inside of the patent application that will may drive it over the edge, just like we've been talking about. And the reason why they they got this particular method of um, patented, which is a method of establishing a campaign for a simulated phishing attack is this highlighted language right here, all right? Um, it says, the simulated phishing email is to be created to have a link to a landing play page comprising type of exploit and the type of exploit configured to collect the selection from one of the, from the one more types of data. And it's this language right here where it says, the, fish, the simulated phishing email is to be created to have a link to a landing page. That particular language right there got it over the edge because no, none of the prior had a link um, to a landing page to kind of, you know, wow. really train the employees what to yeah. do. And I thought that was just super interesting, the fact yeah. that that's what actually kind of pushed it over. That just one little, just just everything else was not enough, but that one little thing pushed it over the edge, you know? Yeah, and that landing, but we've all seen that. It takes you to a fake landing page where it says, enter your username and password or your account number and your password. Mm -hmm. which is what the hackers want right right yeah so i okay. thought that was i thought that was really uh, interesting yeah it's interesting because um because it seems so simple right i mean everyone knows that's what these fake phishing landing pages have right they have mm -hmm. uh, right some text field that makes it look like it's like the microsoft login but it's really not um and then prompts you to enter in your username and password yeah. um, for the undiscerning reader, right? Yeah, I just thought that was so interesting. Um, it's just that one little, this one little, you know, and again, it's not the, the fact that it's it's a phishing email. It's, it's this whole system for an IT manager in order to set up their phishing email campaign. And that phishing email campaign has a simulated email that has a landing page you know, that collects data. I just thought that was so, so interesting. And, and yeah. I've used similar techniques, you know, talking about those little things to get you over the hump to get a software patent, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I've got one last one here for you. Okay. Let's see here. Let me go to the first page of this patent. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so here we have uh, an Apple patent, and uh, uh, it's it's titled "Mode-Based Graphical User Interface for Touch-Sensitive Input Devices." It's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it's basically just a, a type of interface. Okay. Um, now you might think, well, what's like, what's the big deal? I mean, there's you can see the interface right there in that figure. It doesn't look like anything is very interesting about it. Yeah, uh, you know, scrolling. You got cells. You've got um, scroll wheels, and so on and so forth. But if we go to the claim, I want to show you here what I thought was very interesting about this uh, about this patent. And and again, touching on this on this uh, the theme of getting you know what it took to get these patents. What the the piece here that again it was if you look at the history it was just this one phrase that got this allowed was this one right here right i'll i'll spare you the details on the rest of this claim but it's basically just a way of allowing a user to interact with an interface right you got buttons you got scroll wheels and so on and so forth right okay but in this case it was the swirling motion <laughs> It was the swirling motion. So the user creates this swirling motion. And then this program converts that swirling motion that's detected over the um, virtual scroll wheel okay. um, into serial movement. And that's really all it is. It's just detecting this movement, this quote swirling motion and converted it into something that the computer can read to indicate this is where he wants to navigate. Yeah. 
you would think that every you would have thought that any type of gesture or emotion on our interface would have gotten covered already or yeah. would be considered would be considered well known. Not but swirling. Something as simple as that was is what um allowed Apple to get this patent. Yeah. So um, again, it's not rocket scientists. I mean, it's not rocket science. I mean, you're just making a scrolling motion with your finger and the interface is reading it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That just yeah. goes to show you that how like that that's why I love what we do. There's like so many just different things that's with especially with AI and ML, all these different, you know, what seems like super easy, it's not. Like that's the complex software development that takes a long time to develop. And those little simple things can be protected with patent law. So Mm -hmm. Um, I actually have one that's kind of related to, um, I guess it's kind of like machine learning and AI. Um, this is actually a Facebook patent. I've actually spoken about this before in like uh, some blog posts, but essentially, um, this is a patent that detects boredom. So in fact, what's kind of cool about this is that essentially, uh, and I'll show you parts of the claim section here. That's important. Essentially, um, it actually reads your like that looks at your text messages and learns how you text and based upon your speed of your texting it detect it learns or decides if you are bored or not and then based upon your scrolling movements and how you're actually interacting with your phone it'll change your feed based upon how bored they think that the feed thinks you are mm -hmm. so i thought that was super cool and let me show you the part that actually took it over to took it over to um, the edge here. Um, let's see. Here you go. Identic identifying content for display. Okay, based on the presented emotion type. So basically, Facebook sees how you're scro scrolling, sees how you're interacting with your phone and your text messages. And then actually will adjust your feed based upon how bored it thinks you are. In fact, the title of the patent is actually pretty funny. Text, oh, wow. uh, um, techniques and emotion detection and content delivery. So, uh, you know, Big Brother is always watching you. Facebook. Of Facebook. Course. Yeah. So there's actually another one that I wanted to show you. Um, I don't have it with me, but it actually got a patent. And I think there's a lot of bad press around it. And right before, actually, it got a notice of allowance. And right before it was about to issue, they actually filed a petition to withdraw and abandon the patent. A petition? You mean the attorneys to withdraw yeah. the record? Uh, the, no, the, the attorneys filed the petition to withdraw the patent from issuance and basically let it go abandoned. It actually got a notice of allowance. Um, and after it got allowed. They paid the issue fee? They, I think they paid the issue fee. But, yeah, oh, they yes, they, 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 paid, they paid the issue fee and then they filed a they notice to withdrawal from issuance. Yeah. Yeah. And then basically let, went, went a bit. Uh, I may have it here. Let's see here. I just that, couldn't believe I, I thought that, it was that, kind of There funny. was some politics going on there. There was something. Totally. Yeah. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. Now, yeah, let's see here. Yeah, there you go. There it is right here. One of the last one I'll share with you here. Augmenting text messages with emotion information. Right? So here you go. It, it looks to see how oh, you... Uh, Facebook, huh? Yeah, Facebook. Yeah, they see how you're, how slow you're typing so they can see if you're, if you're like, you know, if you're drunk or not. And if you're typing really slow, you may be intoxicated. And I thought it was really interesting. And then it actually looked at the prosecution issue for this application. They withdrew it from um, from issuance. I thought it was kind of fun. Hmm. It would have been interesting. I, I would have I would have liked to see what the uh, you know, I wish there was some sort of record indicating why it is they withdrew it. I don't I don't think they have to give the record, I think. But here here you go. It says so it says predicting an emotion of the user based upon the characteristics of the input. All right. And then formatting a text message based upon the predicted emotion. 
so based on you, emotion. Okay. Yeah. So if like if you're really really fast and really angry, they may give you like a slam luck, you know. Um, so it's the so it's basically so it but it just says formatting. It yeah. Formatting, right? Yep. So I'll, I'll give I'll show some of the examples. I think they actually show it where it's like, you know, let's see here. Um here we go. Can you give me a ride? Can you see this a little bit? Let me yeah, this. I can see that. So here in the example, um, like, can you give me a ride home? If you read the application, and see how it's kind of funny. It's yeah. kind of funky. It's like you detected like you're in the club. You're you know you're typing really slow. So they're like, oh. He's drunk. Let me just write. Let me just change the uh, the look of the of the text messages. So it looks like he's kind of drunk. That's kind of crazy, huh? Yeah, crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you know. I just yeah, this is the one that they went. They never actually got issued. So that was kind of fun. Um, I can see. I can see how detecting someone's emotions could be interesting, and and it could be helpful. Like if someone has um. You know, mental problems. You can detect if they're they might be suicidal, for example. Yeah. If they're manic depressive. You can detect when they're manic or when they're depressive. Um, but it didn't seem like there were any um redeeming qualities like that for that, that application. Yeah, I mean they, they let it go abandoned. Um I just thought it was really interesting. Uh if you if you Google Facebook weird or creepy patterns, there's tons of them that just pop up and you can and you can see it. But the reason why I want to talk about this one in particular is, you know, this is this is this is machine learning and AI, right? So text, you have a set of uh, information that you store in a database, and then based upon an algorithm, you know, it keeps on learning, right? You know, based upon you, in the input, and then pred you know, predicts future outcomes. So right. I, I thought that was really cool, and also. You know, all these patents, a lot of these patents are using, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, which really just are robots, right? Right. Yeah. Well, just for fun, I'll show you this last one here. How do you like this here? Uh, it's a practical time machine. Oh, my God. And you can see it's a method for time travel. <laughs> it allows an object to travel into the past or the future, as well as a method to cut objects from the past or future and paste them into the current environment. Wow. It was rejected. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's really too bad. I think there could have been a lot, a lot of really good applications for that. Yeah, well, we'll wrap this up with um, what maybe you can just give, you know, inventors and other attorneys that don't do a lot of software, What's one piece of advice that you can can maybe provide to them when you're you know when you're looking at something that that's a software related and you're trying to decide if it's patentable or not? What's one piece of advice you think you would give them? Yeah, the so a really common um, issue that I get um, with patent applications for software is just uh, the novelty of it and a. Uh, the conversation I often have with those clients is, hey, there must be some step, some routine, some process that's going on at the back end that is new and different, right? There must be. Um, and we, we often find something. So to give you some examples from the patents we were just looking at, you know, just land, landing that drone on the car, that's well known. But that that one piece that was different was the fact that, hey, now there's a little program that synchronizes their speed, you know. Um, you know so, so I always tell clients, hey, that, that in order to accomplish what you're accomplishing with the software, I'm sure you did something. There was some little piece there, some little step that's new and different. If we did a search, we wouldn't find that one step in the, in the patent database. And that's the key to getting it allowed. Yeah, that's great advice. Um... Another one I like to give um, along the same lines, quite honestly, is, and we've talked about, about this before, you know, the one-on-one rejections, the 35 UFC one-on-one rejections, um, a lot of times 
it comes down to, you know, making the argument that, hey, listen, you know, this is actually finding something new that's not obvious to get around that one-on-one rejection. So to the to your to your point about the um, the drone patent, just find that one little piece that hasn't been done before to get around those one-on-one rejections that are so common for yeah. for software patent applications. I think is um, you know is what I would say to maybe another attorney that's looking to try to figure out how to get around those one-on-one rejections. Because to the untrained eye, I feel like they're they, they can be a bit overwhelming when you look at a one-on-one rejection for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of overlap there between finding something, finding some claim element that you can use to get past a 103 rejection and also using it to get past a 101 rejection. There's a lot of overlap there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's really all we got for today, this podcast. Hopefully people viewing it will find it helpful. You can find us uh, at www.plusfirm.com. And um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, you can reach out to Mark um, at Mark Terry PA. That's on his Instagram handle. My Instagram handle is Derek Fahey PA. That's um, M A R K T E R R Y P A. And then my Instagram handle is Derek D E R E K F A H E Y P A. Um, hope you guys enjoyed watching and uh, see you next time. Take care, everybody.